Hey YouTube, welcome to my third video. Today we're going to be talking about impedance matching with L networks. But before I talk that, I want to address a question that I've received from uh, several subscribers. They asked me, how do I get into RF? What's the best way of getting into RF? And uh, the answer is there, there is no recipe how to get into RF, but my, uh, my best advice is just do it. Don't think so much about how you're going to go about it and, and all that. Just simply do it. Try an error. And there's going to be lots of error. RF has a big potential for error, which is fine. I mean, the first oscillator that I tried to intentionally build, it took me quite a while till that thing finally worked. And uh, audio engineers, they probably will tell you, just try to build an amplifier. It's going to start oscillating. That's usually how it goes in electronics. When you try to build something extremely stable, it starts oscillating, and if you're trying to build something that oscillates, it'll stay stable and won't do what you want. That's just how it goes. And after a while, you will know why it's doing that, and you will you know exactly how to fix it. And even professionals, they simulate circuits all day long, and then they have their first production build and it doesn't work. That's simply how it goes. Uh, one thing I want to stress is you do not need fancy equipment. You know. Uh, like that oscilloscope behind me and, and all the other stuff. You don't need that to start out with. Back in the days, uh, just think about it, like a hundred years back, what people built at home, especially amateur radio operators, they had no problem building transceivers at home in their basements with very minimalistic gear. You don't need a, uh, a vector network analyzer, for instance, to plot out uh, the frequency response of an antenna. You can do that with a with a dip meter or you can sit down with a frequency generator and a uh, SWR bridge and, and all kinds of other things. Um, I really recommend you get a RF generator of some sort and uh, an RF voltmeter. An oscilloscope is nice to have and that should be pretty much it for the beginning. That's always good. And the other thing is, RF is pretty much everything between DC and sunlight, and your requirements are going to be different depending on where exactly in the spectrum you want to be. There are some enthusiasts which work um, in the 136 kilohertz range on, on uh, you know, long wave communications, and others like me like the upper end, the gigahertz bands, and the requirements are entirely different. So as opposed to trying to figure out what you need for certain things, See what you can already do with the equipment you have. And uh, as far as books are concerned, the big recommendation I have is buy this book. And back here should be the ISBN and the UPC. I hope the camera focuses on that. This book is awesome. It's a very comprehensive guide on RF circuit design. And um, I have to say it really starts at an upper intermediate level. Um, it's assuming that you have lots of electronic skills already and goes into RF, it really deep, it dives in very deep. But don't be afraid, buy that book, look at it, you'll love it. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about impedance matching and uh, I'm going to switch camera positions for that. Okay, here's our problem. We have a 75 ohm source and a 1 kilo ohm load. Now for a perfect power transfer between the source and the load, the impedances need to be equal. Uh, be careful when you work with complex impedances where you have an inductive and a capacitive part, you want the opposite. So you, if you have, let's say, a small inductive part next to your real source uh, load, then you want to have a little bit of capacitance on your load and vice versa. It's very important. But uh, we're just gonna work on real impedances now. We have a 75 ohm source, a entirely real 75 ohms, and an entirely real resistor of one kilo ohms over here. If we'd connect them just like that, we wouldn't get all the power from the source to the load. So we need to insert something here that matches those two together. And uh, that's what we can do for instance. This is called an L network because of its L shape and it consists out of a serious inductor and a shunt capacitor. Now I've wrote values down here already and that's uh, negative J284 and J263. 
if you're not familiar with complex impedances or with the vector notation of impedances don't be scared where you would ordinarily calculate the impedance of a capacitor as let's say 284 ohms as a given point we would we write it like this negative j 284 to mark that it is a capacitive impedance likewise with the inductor this is nothing else but an impedance of 263 ohms entirely inductive and we put a positive j in front of it to mark that uh, mathematicians use i the imaginary unit we engineers use j because i is already otherwise occupied now before i explain to you how i got this circuit let me explain how it works um, to do that we're gonna break this circuit down into a series equivalent circuits let's start and separate this here this real resistor and this capacitor, they have a combined resistance or a combined impedance. Ordinarily, you would uh, calculate your overall impedance, if, you, if those were two real resistors, by multiplying the two and dividing the entire result by uh, multiply, uh, adding those two together. So if you would have two 1 kilo ohm resistors, you take 1 times 1 divided by 1 plus 1. The same here to get our impedance marked as Z. We're going to take XC, which is the impedance of the capacitor, times our real resistance. Let's mark this as RL, our index L for our load. And uh, down here, we're going to have XC plus RL. And if we plug in our values with the complex notation, we have negative J284 times 1 kilo ohm divided by negative J284 plus 1 kilo ohm. All right. And if you plug that into your calculator, you're going to get that we have a... Uh, let me go this way because I kind of messed up the space over there. You're going to get 75 ohms minus J263. That means this capacitor and this resistor act just like a 75 ohm real load with a serious capacitance of 263 ohms. So if we redraw that. load still one kilo ohm incorrect we're working on the equivalent here 75 ohms this one here has negative j263 this one still has j263 as impedance as our ground point and you can already tell something you have negative j263 and j263 here those two cancel each other out. That means the only thing that will be left is the real 75 ohms resistance. So our overall series equivalent circuit is, I know my drawings are horrible, 75 ohms. It's really that simple. Now, again, my graphics, my hand drawing sucks. If you want some, uh, some better graphics, go on my webpage. The link's on the bottom. And I already wrote a text article on this. And uh, it has much better pictures, definitely. This video is supposed to focus more on the practical side in a second. And not so much on the theory. Now, how do you get the values? After I explained how this is being done, there's a couple of formulas. Let's start with a blank circuit again. Okay, our one kilo ohm 
is given by the problem and our load, no sorry, source impedance is given as well. So the first thing you want to calculate is uh, Q, the uh, quality factor, and you can pick one or uh, there's a formula that's generally accepted. Okay, and let me move this up a little bit. I'll show you how that's being done. Okay, Q is equal to the square root of uh, your load resistance over your source resistance minus 1 so in our case 1000 over 75 minus 1 now that's that's in, inside the root and in our case this is about 3.512 okay and uh, if you remember the old values, you can already tell the relationship between the serious uh, impedance and the uh, the shunt capacitor's impedance. Namely, to get the serious impedance, the serious inductor's impedance, we are multiplying by Q. We're multiplying the source by Q. So, XL equals... 3.512 times 75 ohms and that equals roughly 263.4 and I rounded it to 263 and we put J in front of it to mark that it is an inductive impedance. Now as far as XC is concerned we take our uh, load impedance, in this case a real resistance, and divide it by our Q. So, 1000 divided by 3.512 equals 284, and then again 0.7 something, and I rounded it. And if we want to mark that it is a uh, capacitive impedance, then we would write negative J to 84. 284 is of course not equal to negative J284 but you get the picture. And uh, to now, if you really want to use this circuit you're going to have to pick a frequency, an operating frequency. The circuit is not really a uh, wide band. You're going to have to pick a frequency. In my case I use 16 megahertz. There's, there's no real reason except for that I had parts available for that. Now, if you have the given impedance values and you want to uh, transform that into, into real-world dimensions for a capacitor and an inductor, let's start with the, uh, with the inductor. You would take uh, your, uh, your impedance, in our case 263, divided by 2 pi, the frequency, now, okay, 16 megahertz. I'll do this shorthand like that. And that equals 2.6 something microhenries. Let's round that again. And for your capacitor, it's going to go uh, the other way around. 1 divided by 2 pi f, our frequency times the impedance, which we calculated as uh, 284, and that equals roughly, well, where am I, 35 picofarads, okay, and uh, that's how you get the values. Now we're going to set it up and we're going to see how much the uh, values actually meet reality because theory and uh, reality are always uh, two different things. And this is how the circuit looks like on a little bit of uh, breadboard. Right here you see the inductor. Here's our 1 kilo ohm resistor. 
this over here is a 33 picofarad capacitor and you see the the values are slightly different from what we calculated those were values that I had available and uh, we're going to talk about this here in a second but here's the signal coming through this red wire from my 75 ohm impedance source and we're trying to get the most power into this one kilo ohm resistor now of course it would be nice for us being able to measure how well the circuit actually performs and for that I got this directional coupler right here and directional couplers depending on how you use them they go under different names um, um, directional coupler is the most correct term and then there is return loss bridge and SWR bridge and all kinds of other terms what this thing basically does this here is normally the in port this here is what's called the coupled port and this is the out port and what this does it uh, it takes a little bit of RF that goes this way and couples it out this way but everything that comes through this way will never make it here that's the theory in real life some will of course always come through but the idea behind it is the way I inserted it now that only you know energy comes out from the source moves over here goes into our load and only signal that gets returned due to uh, impedance mismatches will come out here goes in and reflected signal goes out this way and some gets coupled out that way so if we look at our oscilloscope in a second we will be able to see how much energy actually gets reflected okay now here's the oscilloscope screen and uh, I know that uh, the reflectivity of the oscilloscope is probably gonna be a, a slight problem for the video I mean I can see myself perfectly in the camera that's not so good but anyway you can see the waveform right there now I left the directional coupler open the uh, the input that we're using as output because we want to see the reflected power um, is open right now so this is a uh, 75 ohm load sorry source and a infinity or near infinity in theory load now I made this uh, little of course won't focus this close one kilo ohm load I basically took a BNC connector and I crimped a one kilo ohm resistor in there so if I put this one kilo ohm resistor on the output you'll see that the reflected power goes down a little bit but not by much that's not much of a difference if I take one of those uh, commercial 75 ohm ones, which is the correct impedance for this entire system, this is what happens. Look, the reflected power is as tiny compared to what it was beforehand. So, if I connect our circuit that we just calculated, that's what I'm getting. This is at 16 megahertz. And if I increase the frequency, 16.1, we see it actually goes, goes, goes smaller. And... Uh, as I go up, now 17.3 megahertz, 18 megahertz, 19 megahertz, a reflected power goes bigger. And if I go back down again, it goes smaller. And wherever our smallest spot is, I would say about right there, at 16.4 megahertz, um, we see that we are 400 kilohertz off from theory, but there's a simple reason for that. Real life circuits are not ideal. Uh, especially RF um, is never a good thing for breadboards. Breadboards have lots of uh, stray capacitance and there's stray inductance and all kinds of other nasty stuff that we didn't take uh, into our equation. You can do that and I mean in real life you often deal with the complex impedances on both sides. You'll rarely have a load that's entirely real and a uh, source that's entirely real so you can just calculate that in. But for the sake of this video let's leave it at that. There we go, going down to 14 megahertz. And back up. So, that's how that works. It's as simple as that. I, um, I will link my text article that I wrote in my blog down the bottom of this video. So uh, that you can read up on all this. The formulas are there and they're going to be uh, much better graphics than what I drew by hand. And I hope you enjoyed it and there's going to be more videos to come soon. Thank you very much and don't forget to subscribe.